Hello and welcome to Let's Talk with Bishop R.C. Blakes. R.C. is an author, empowerment teacher, and the proud pastor of the New Home Ministries of New Orleans, Louisiana and Houston, Texas. His message circles the globe. His conversational and candid approach to challenging content makes him a relevant voice to all generations. Get ready for a life-changing transformational conversation. Hey, hey, this is R.C. Blakes, and thank you so much for tuning in today. I am so excited about our discussion today. Um, I'd love for you to invite some people to come in and to be a part of our conversation because I, I think this one is, is needful. I, I, get a lot of, uh, I get a lot of questions relative to, you know, relationships, of course, but more specifically relating to relationships that uh, are over, you know, and for whatever reason, people feel uh, compelled to, to hang in there uh, for religious reasons, for personal responsibility reasons, for um, in the purposes of, you know, maintaining your circle. You know, the two of you shared the same circle and you, you're trying to just piece this thing together and make this thing work. And, you know, it, the reality is it's over. It's over. You know, Ray Charles can see that it's, it's over. And, and you're holding on to it because you don't want to feel like you're disappointing, you know, God. You don't want to feel like you're disappointing your family, your children and all of this. And you're hanging on to this stuff for everything uh, but yourself. Now, don't get me wrong. Relationships are work. Marriage, more specifically, is work. And marriage requires that we go overboard and that we do our, you know, very best personally to make that thing work. The two of you have to come together to actually make a marriage work. One person can't do it. We have uh, different uh, religious perspectives on the situation. You know, some people are so legalistic and you know, other people are so carefree that they've diluted the, the whole uh, concept of marriage being covenant. But at the end of the day, when it all boils down, um, you're going to have to be wise enough to be able to determine if this thing is over or not. Because sometimes you're trying to resuscitate, you know, a dead horse. I don't care how much you compress the chest and try to breathe in the horse's mouth and nostrils. I know that's a horrible <laughs> visual there. Uh, the horse is dead. You know, I mean, you may be heartbroken. You may be sick about it. You may be disappointed. You may feel like a failure. But when you get through with all of these emotions and all of these feelings, it's still dead. And the sooner you accept that this is over and then begin to chart your next, okay, it's over for whatever reason. Maybe I messed up. Maybe I killed the relationship. And, you know, I need to apologize to the person if they will receive it. But I need to repent before God. But whatever the case, it's over. It's done. It's finished. Now I need to move forward with my life because that's over. Listen to what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. It says, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace 
and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away. Life is a seesaw. There are seasons that we win, seasons that we lose, seasons that we get, seasons that we have to cast away. And they're, they're, unfortunately, most of the relationships in our lives are, are going to be seasonal, you know, and have expiration dates on it. Most of you that are watching me right now can testify that you had at least one other relationship that you thought was going to go the distance, but you discovered that it had an expiration date on it. And the worst thing to do is to come to the point where you've surpassed the expiration date and yet you're trying to make it work anyway. It's like me, you know, I spend a lot of time prior to COVID-19, I would spend a lot of time away from my wife when I would travel a lot and moving back and forth from Louisiana to Texas and back and forth. And so there are days that I didn't have my wife around. I don't know how to cook. And there are nights that, you know, I, I don't want to go to a restaurant. I don't, you know, so I'll just have cereal and I'll have milk. Well, the problem is that when you travel as much as I used to travel, there, there are times that you bought the milk, you know, this day, but you, you leave in tomorrow. And the next time you can actually see the milk is like three weeks from from that point. You're not, you know, at least me, I'm not thinking about you know, my travel schedule. So when I get back and I'm getting settled and I'm in the bed and I got my cereal and I pour that milk in there and that milk is spoiled. And then I read the date and it says, well, it expired seven days ago. Well, you can't try to make that milk good. I don't care how disappointed. I don't care what your intentions were. Well, you know, I, 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 I intended on and I had. You cannot make that milk good. You have to accept that the milk is expired. I'm either not going to eat cereal tonight or I'm going to just consume all of this bad milk and probably get sick. Or I'm going to go and get a proper gallon of milk that is within the proper time frame. Well, if that wisdom applies to something as negligible as as milk and cereal, how much more must that apply to relationships? It's a bad thing to be out here in a relationship that's over and you still in there, you know, you're the only one that's clueless relative to this, the fact that this thing is over. You can ask your babies, they can tell you it's over. Go ask your children right now. They can tell you, oh, that's over, man. That, that's, that's been over about two years now. I don't know what you're hanging on for. Your children can tell you, it's over. Yeah, Pops, yeah, that, that chick don't want you for nothing but your money. That, that's been over, Doc, you know. Well, let's look at some things tonight, today, whenever you're watching this, that I just believe are some common sense signals, red flags, if you would, that this thing is over. Number one. You've said some things or both of you have said some things to demean or humiliate each other. You've intentionally said some things to demean or humiliate each other. You, you cannot unsay or unhear words that were spoken with the intent of injuring. See, now, people in relationships, you know, are very sensitive to one another because typically there's a lot invested, there's a lot on the line, and there's a lot of love involved. But when a relationship has become so toxic that one or both intentionally use their, use his or her words to injure the other, in terms of self-esteem, you know, self-perspective, just, you know, using words like, like a knife or a gun, it's, it's gonna be hard to come back from that. You know, Lisa and I have had arguments and, you know, I mean, that's just the part, that's a part of being in a relationship. 
But neither of us has ever said in all of the years we've been together something that the other had to come back and get clarity on, you know, puzzled by why you said that. N neither of us has ever said anything to intentionally demean or diminish or injure the esteem of the other. You know, we might be arguing about what well, you was wrong and I was right. Yeah, I said this and you didn't say that. Yeah, you did say that. But never something that causes the other to pause and look and listen intently because the words are so injurious. And there are some of you who are in situations right now where the two of you are constantly throwing blows at one another, shooting words at one another like like arrows from a bow constantly. And then you want to know. Is this over or not? Can we make a run of this? I think when you've said when you've said so much stuff that. You know, the other person's chemistry, that it's changed the chemistry of the relationship or both of you have been changed and the other person can't look at you without being hurt. Um, I think it's over. I really do. I mean, unless you all I mean, you have to do a lot of personal changing. The other person is going to have to do a lot of intentional or both of you may have to do a lot of intentional forgiving. And even after all of that. You know, once you've said certain things, it's going to be hard to dial that thing back and bring that thing back to the chemistry that you once knew. It's going to be very, very difficult. This is why the Bible says you have to be swift to hear, slow to speak and slow to get angry, because once you say these words, you can't unsay them. Once you say certain things to a woman. She can't unhear it. You can't unsay it. Once you say certain things to a man and women typically use words a lot to break a man down because you can't compare physically in most cases. So women many times fight with words. But once you break a man's spirit with your words, it's going to be impossible for him to unhear what you said. Now, you know, God can do all things, but I think this is a case where you will really truly need God to intervene. Listen to what the Bible says here in Luke 6, 4, 6 and 45. It says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. Here's the, here's the, here's the kicker. You said it. I was angry. Well, you said it. Now, anger might be the thing that pulled, pulled the lid off of your heart, but that was in your heart. And that's the way, you know, your partner is, is going to look at words that just come out of your mouth that are constantly demeaning, diminishing, humiliating and breaking them. These things must be in your heart. And then you have to stop and you have to ask yourself. You know, why am I trying to preserve this thing if this is where my heart really is? If I really believe that this person is stupid and worthless and unattractive and, and all of these kinds of things that you say when you get angry, why, why am I still here? Because it came out of your mouth. I mean, Lisa and I have been together for, you know, married going on 27, I think it is, and been together for 30 plus and she's never said anything to me that you know makes me and she's gotten angry with me and I've never said anything to her that that makes her question my love for her or the sincerity of my affections because that's never been in my heart that's never been in her heart and so if, if you all are constantly saying things to, you know, berate, destroy each other, you have to ask yourself, where is this coming from? Why are we in such a toxic position? 
And why are we trying to preserve something that is clearly dysfunctional? And listen to what the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 27, 28 says an ungodly man uh, diggeth up evil. And in his lips, there is a there is as a burning fire. A forward man soweth strife and a whisperer separate the chief friends. But he says he digs up evil. There are some relationships that you all have where it's like you take the other person's or they take your failures or both of you all do it to each other and you store it away waiting for the next opportunity to use this against one another. It's over, babe. It's over. Well, we're staying together for the children. What are you trying to do for the children? You're trying to teach the children how uh, to create dysfunctional lives and what a dysfunctional relationship looks like. Are you trying to traumatize the children with all of this chaos going on between two people who probably should have never been together making children in the beginning? I mean, I, you know, I mean, you got to make up your own mind. But I think that when 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 words are, you know, thrown around that are destroying one another. And when, you know, when it's just constantly and it's just intentional, it's not misunderstandings. This stuff is intentional and it's clear that you you threw this, you know, word out here, this phrase out here. You brought this up because you wanted to destroy my spirit. Why, 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 why are we doing this? Number two, it's over. Number two, you've begged You've begged, 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 and they have not responded to you favorably. It's over. I don't care how much you, you think you love them. You, you begging? I mean, you just literally out here begging somebody? I mean, you just out here begging somebody to take you and to love you and to want you? Come on, man. You got to have more respect for yourself than that. And I, know, I mean, I get it, you know, but... You can't just be out here begging somebody and they're not responding to you. They don't have enough respect for you to, to even respond to you. And you're begging. You've called a hundred times in the last 24 hours and they won't answer the phone. You've gone by the house and they, they won't open the door. Come on, man. Come on, man. It's over. When, when you out here having to beg somebody to be with you, I mean, it's over. It's over. I mean, it ain't no other way to say that. You out here having to beg this person and, and you're begging and they still won't respond to you. They don't love you. That's over. They don't even have respect for you. They have no regard for you. They, they've clearly gotten whatever it, is, whatever it is they've wanted from the connection and now they've chosen to move on. Fair or not, you can't, you can't do anything about that. If they've made a decision to move on without you, there's nothing that you can do to change that. And begging and begging and begging and hanging around and hanging around and thinking you're going to beg somebody into loving you is misguided. And if they did return to you, they, they, they would only return to you because they feel sorry for you. At a certain point, you, you know, you're just pitiful in their eyes or, or they they've made a decision to use you some more uh, for whatever it is that um, you bring to the table. But anybody that you got to beg, come on now. That that's that's a bad look. That's a bad choice. That's a bad um, arrangement for the beggar. You know, um, you got to let it go. You just got to at a certain point, you just got to let it go. Go to look at one of my favorite texts when dealing with this kind of subject is Genesis 29, 31 through 35. There you have 31 through 35. There you have Leah, the wife of Jacob. Now you read the whole story. Jacob, this, these are biblical times. So men had more than one wife. Jacob married uh, Leah first, but he didn't really he didn't love Leah. In fact, the Bible says he hated her. He loved Rachel, but he was tricked into marrying Leah first because she was the older daughter. So the father of the both, both of the girls, they were sisters, pushed Leah off on him, but he hated Leah. And Leah knew she was hated, but she kept trying to do 
whatever she could do to, to ultimately be accepted, and she was never really accepted. So let me, let me take up for you. Genesis 29, 31 through 35 says, And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb or allowed her to become pregnant. But Rachel was barren, couldn't get pregnant. And Leah conceived and bare a son and called his name Reuben. For she, she said, surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Mm. Verse 33. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he had therefore given me this son also. She called his name Simeon. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, now this time will my husband be joined unto me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was, therefore was his name called Levi. And she conceived again and bare a son. And she said, now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah and left bearing. But she, she was in a posture where it was like she was constantly begging for this man's affection, begging for this man's acceptance, begging for this man's attention, and he would never give it. He kept having sex with her, kept, you know, making babies with her, but he always hated her. Because anybody that will let you beg one time, two times, now, you know, if you've done something wrong, really bad, a person will let you beg just to prove that you are sorrowful. But they ain't going to let you, if they really feel you, they're not going to let you beg and beg and beg and beg. They're going to receive you and throw their arms around you. But if a person not feeling you, it doesn't matter how much you beg, they'll keep using you. But it's never going to make them love you. Begging will never make a person love you. If they don't love you already they're never going to love you. And the best thing you can do is pick up your little, you know, pick your little feelings up off the ground and keep it moving and do what's best for you as an individual. Now, here's the third thing. Um, you know that it's over when this person has triggered your distrust to a point that you're now out of character. You know that it's over. You see, you, you've been traumatized in the past by somebody that broke your heart or whatever, and now you're in this new situation, and this person has disregarded your past history of having been, you know, abused, having been lied to, and they, they've just constantly triggered your distrust. They understand that you're trying to regain your trust, but they're constantly doing things to trigger distrust in you, make you, you know, make you recall some of the situations that you've gone through in the past, and now they have triggered your distrust to the point that now you're out of character. Here you are, educated, spirit-filled, beautiful woman, and here you hiding behind the bushes trying to catch, trying to see who, here you are out in the street, you know, arguing and fussing with uh, some woman about a man. Here you are all over social media, you know, you, you, you're obsessed with trying to see who's liking his post or who's liking her post, and here you are confronting people in the DMs. Man, come on. Bad look, bad look, bad look, bad look. This person has triggered your distrust to a point that you are now out of character. It's time to let this go. Time out, time out, time out. Let me check out of this game. Let me check out of this game because anybody that would trigger your distrust to the point that you are now living out of character. You, you, don't, you don't need this person in your life. This person and you, you know, y'all not meant to be together. This person is not a good fit for you 
because they seem to bring the worst out of you. And, and you, you watch this. It also is an indication to you that you have some personal healing and work to do on yourself. Because you need to be able to get over and you need to be able to determine that a person is triggering you long before you get to the point where you're all out of character. And you're behaving like somebody you don't even recognize. Because that's bad energy. And listen to what the Bible says in James uh, chapter 3 and verse 16 says for where envying and strife is there's confusion and every evil work where envying or jealousy and strife are this any kind of negative energy he says there's confusion and every evil work once confusion gets into the situation it it begins to build layers of negativity, layers of negativity, layers of negativity. You know, Othello, one of Shakespeare's characters, that jealousy built layers and layers and layers until he ultimately killed the woman. Well, you don't want to be a person that's caught up in a situation where a person is clearly triggering you. And now you're at a point where you are so out of character that you're beginning to do things that don't mirror who you are, what you stand for, or where you're going in life. This quite often happens to a PhD woman that's manipulated by a GED man. He triggers you and triggers you until you lose all connection to yourself. And then you lose yourself so much that when it's time to return to yourself, you can't find yourself. So now you develop an adopted identity. You begin to settle for things. When the flag was the fact that this person triggers you into behavior that is unlike anything you were raised to be or do, or anything you personally believe in. People look at the way you're behaving, it does not equate relative to who you really are. It's over. Number four, uh, kind of bleeds out of that one, but number four, you know that it's over when you are constantly exchanging your dignity for promises. You are constantly exchanging your dignity for promises. I promise you, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And I promise you, I'm going to get it together. I promise you, I'm going to get a job. I promise you, I'm not going to sleep with them no more. I promise you, I'm done with that. I'm done with that. And, and here you are, here you know that your dignity is being spilled on the ground when you keep saying the same words over and over again. If you do it again, if you do it again. You know, when you first started saying that, you were 20 some years old. You still saying that, now you're 40 some years old. It was over the first time you had to say, if you do it again, you're constantly exchanging your dignity for promises. Let me tell you something. There, there has to be lines and limits. There's a point that a person has to be able to push you to that you say, I, I love me more than I love the idea of us. Oh, I, that was good right there. Oh, that was good right there. Somebody need to write that. I, I got to get that. I love me. I love the reality of me more than I love the idea of us. And I'm not going to allow you to squander my dignity for promise after promise after promise after promise and all of them are empty. But it's over when you wake up and you realize, you know, I've been I've been exchanging my dignity for unfulfilled promises. Once, you, once you're conscious of that, well, 
What you going to do with that? Are you going to continue to allow a person to drain your dignity, your energy, your self-respect, and all they got to give you is a promise, the wimpy syndrome? You remember wimpy? Well, you, you may not. You may, some of y'all may be too young, but if you're my age, you know something about Popeye the Sailor Man. And it was a cartoon. And when, you know, on Popeye the Sailor Man was a character by the name of Wimpy. Wimpy was always going around. He loved hamburgers. He was always going around, you know, uh, borrowing money for a hamburger, borrowing a hamburger today, and I'll gladly pay you Tuesday. Tuesday never got there. Wimpy never paid anybody. He always promised to pay, but he never paid anybody. The Wimpy syndrome. Wimpy strung everybody along, had them... Uh, you know, feeding his habit, enabling his dysfunction on promises alone. Think about it. When's the last time one of these promises was ever fulfilled? And you want to know if it's over? Listen to what 1 John 4 and 1 says. Beloved, believe not every spirit but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets or liars are gone out into the world. Don't believe everything you hear is what the text is saying, but test this stuff. And what's the, what's the number one test of a person being honest or not? Have they ever done any? Have they ever come through on any promise promise made? The last thing they told you, did they come through on that? The thing before that? Have they have they come through on anything? Have they been right on anything? Have they been honest on anything? Have they, have they followed through on anything? No, no, no. Why constantly exchange your dignity for promises? That's over, babe. Go and cry. Go to go to your house. Cry for a week, however long you think it, but it's over. That's over. That's over. That's over. And that, do, that doesn't just go one way. That's not just, you know, mostly women that do this, but you have, you have men that do this, that exchange your dignity for promises. You, you get a, a, an ungodly, evil woman, man, I promise you, will wreck your life. Wreck your complete and total life. It goes both ways. And at a certain point, you got to wake up. You got to have more love for the reality of you than the idea of y'all. So you married to the idea. And because you've invested so much time, you don't you feel like you don't want to lose your, your investment of time and resources and all of that. Bay, it's better to let that little stuff go than to lose your soul. Caught up in a soul tie going nowhere but to hell. You are constantly exchanging your dignity for promises. It's over. Number five. Here's a big one. You know that it's over when you sit down there at your kitchen table and you're plotting on how you can get even. He cheated on you, so now you're plotting on how you're going to go sleep with um, his friend or something like that. Y'all, sometimes you might get so diabolical you think about sleeping with one of his relatives. And, all. and, you know, people's minds go there when they've been hurt that hard, hurt that bad. But, you know, the moment you see your, your, your thinking going in, going in that direction, that should be an indication to you. This is a red flag. It's on fire. And this is over because the only way for you to get even with a dirty, low down, demonic person is to go is to sink to their level. The only way you can get even with a person in the gutter is that you got to get gutter with them. And when you start having ideas of of, you know, disregarding your principles and, and abandoning, you know, uh, the laws of God and your self-respect to get even with something that's always been beneath you. You got to wake up and realize this is over. Let me just cut my losses and move on with my life. Let me not compound the impact of this fool's presence in my life 
by doing something as foolish as getting even. If you sitting there thinking about getting even, it's over. It's over. It's over. It's over. It's over. It's over. Because the only way to get even is, is to sink. Now, unless you just want to sink, I'm here to tell you, you sitting there thinking about getting even, it's over. Now, if you want to sink, just stick with this here. Listen to what the Bible says in uh, Proverbs 6, 34 and 35. For jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. What is it talking about here? Point five, you're, you're plotting to get even. Or they're plotting to get even with you. What it's talking about here is you can a person can be pushed to a point where they are no longer in control of their faculties and they're pushed beyond their capacity to restrain themselves for jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. This is how people who are not murderers murder people. You find somebody that is just constantly breaking your heart, breaking your heart to the point that you're sitting in now thinking about how you can get even with them. You have to know that you are on a demonic track that is designed to destroy your entire life. And the question you have to ask yourself, is this worth it? Jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. The day of what? Getting even. He will not regard any ransom. You, you won't be able to pay him. You won't be able to buy him off. His rage, her rage will just drive her. So when you start having thoughts of getting even with a person, you then know, yeah, this is over. This is over. I think that that may be one of the reasons why one of the clear cut biblical um, reasons, legitimate reasons for divorce is adultery. By that walks out and commits adultery on you, sleep with somebody else, you know, Bible gives you the right to move forward or not. It's because when that kind of thing has happened, it, it breaks the soul to a point that you don't know what you're going to be turned into. You don't know where this is going to go. So when you wake up and you realize that you're plotting to get even with this person, you then know that this is over. Now, let me hurry this up. I don't want to keep you too long today. Number six, you know that this is over when your family, your friends, and your coworkers can tell you the cycle that you're in or the cycle you're about to go through with this person before it even starts. Sometimes, you know, you're caught up in soul tie situations where a person is managing and manipulating you and controlling you and you don't realize that they have you on a set schedule, you know, Every, every four or five weeks, this is going to happen. Three weeks after that, that's going to happen. A week after that, that's going to happen. And, and they have you on such, uh, you know, such a, um, the little wheel that the, 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 the mouse runs on. They have you on such a treadmill 
and 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 they just they're managing you and manipulating you like like a puppet master and even your children can tell you what what's getting ready to happen next well you know my you better not do that because if you do this Harold is going to do that and then Harold's going to say this and then Harold's going to leave for three or four days and then Harold's going to come back with with some flowers and Harold's going to tell you he's sorry and you're going to say if you do it again then Harold's going to get back in again and he's going to do it to you when you find yourself caught up on somebody else's schedule you are no longer even living as an individual and now even though the people that are closest to you can see how you're managed and your mama can tell you exactly what's going on before you open your mouth you've always been this is not a relationship this is a this is a manipulation and 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 it's over to be, to be honest with you it's over now i know some of you are going to have to go back and get bit again you have to touch that stove one more time to see that it, it really was hot but when when your life is just on a schedule and you've been in this same cycle for the last decade every time you try to say okay well i'm done with this i'm finished i'm out of here then there's another promise to marry you and you melt all over again your children are sitting there looking at you they're just sitting there staring at you you know every time you know it's it's just it's a never-ending cycle. There's, it's just, you're on a schedule, you're programmed like a robot, you're programmed, and they're just constantly pushing those same buttons. They're triggering you, and it's intentional triggering. They know exactly what, they press this button to make you go that way, they press that trigger to make you go that way, and they're bouncing you back and forth, and you don't even realize it because you don't really, know the last time you even listened to your family or your friends, you've been so emotionally isolated with this individual that you don't even hear your own children. It's not until y'all, you know, your children, you know, blow up and threaten to walk out of your life or something, then you want to hear your children and you realize that the children know more about your situation than you do because you're the only one that's clueless. You've been programmed, you've been in a program for the last X amount of years. You've been calling it love when the whole while it's been, you know, manipulation. It's been narcissistic abuse in some cases. But you the, you the, last, you the last one, you, you've been clueless. But when you wake up and you realize that this person, the cycles are consistent, Nothing's changing, nothing's new. Nothing's evolving, nothing's growing. And then number seven, and I'm done. You know that it's over when you don't really want it no more. And I, I'm, I'm going to explain that. But you know that it's over when you don't really want it anymore. And this is not for, this is not for those of you who, who are having affairs, you know, and you, you, because you're sitting under the influence of um, adultery. You're sitting there talking about, you know, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really want it anymore. You, 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 you're really confused. But I'm talking about those of you who are in situations where you've tried, you've given it your all, you've given it your best, and you just don't want it no more. Now, some will say, well, that's not being fair to the other person. I think it's being unfair to, to, to the other person to stay in a situation that you, where you really don't want the person and you've maybe done a good job of disguising it I don't think that's fair. Now, if you, you have a good person that, you know, um, has done nothing but right towards you and you don't know why you got into this and you really don't want them, I think it's fair to let them know that. Now, you have to also understand that 
you're going to pay a price for having done something like that, but I don't think you should compound the problem by wasting more of that person's life in a, in a, in a false love affair. You're not doing me any favors by acting like you love me when you really don't love me or acting like you want me when you really don't want me. You know it's over when you wake up and you say, I, I really don't want this no more. And you're not under the influence of anybody else. You know, you're not out here cheating, but I just don't, I don't love you. I don't want you like this. And I'm just, um, I, I'm just in here trying to save face. You know, I would suggest that you, if, if, if both of you all are, are good people and, and nobody's, you know, try some counseling to see if there's something going on with you personally that's, you know, preventing you from connecting. But all things being equal, when all things are said and done, you come back to the place where I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want them. I don't, I don't want it. It's over. Uh, you know, I mean, mama and them can pray and all of that. And, but if, if the two of y'all don't want it, only way marriage works, both of y'all got to want it, man. Listen, listen, I know people put on social media and stuff when they see Lisa and I talking about relationship goals. Listen, relationships are very, very difficult to manage. You know, it's, it's like surfing. You have to be able to grow with the person you have to shift with the person. You gotta, you have to evolve together, you know, and sometimes watch this. When you have a relationship that's gone on as long as me and Lisa's has, there are times that you, 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 you lose the connection. Y'all not feeling one another no more. You know what I mean? You don't feel like you, um, you don't feel like you're in love no more and all of this kind of thing. And the thing that keeps you together is you got children together, you got bills together, and then, but then you're wise enough to, to try to reconnect and you don't allow anybody to get in the middle of that situation during one of those seasons. And then you live a little bit and you realize that you have seasons where you grow apart and then you come back together and then you grow apart and then you come back. Every time you come back together, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. But the only way you're going to be able to grow and come back together is that both of y'all got to want one another. If either of you wakes up and does not want the other, you will not survive those seasons without affairs. If you know, if, if you don't want that person, you know, it's going to be difficult to survive that season without an affair or without just completely abandoning the relationship. So if you if you don't want the person, it's over. I mean, the religious people can point their finger and say this and that, and all you have to answer to God. That's for true. God knows y'all. But if you don't want them, you don't want them. And <clears throat> counseling, much prayer. And I think if you're in, if you're in that state now, I think it's why it would be wise for you to go to some personal counseling to vent uh, your thoughts because you want to make certain that there's nothing, again, personal going on with you that's preventing you from connecting with the other person. If that doesn't work, now you need some couples counseling, especially, especially if you're married. Because you want to be completely and totally fair to this person. You want to be honest, but you want to be honest in a context where they are able to get the kind of emotional support and help they're going to need when they lose what they thought was their primary support system, which is you. But if you don't want them, if it boils down to the fact that it's just, it's just, that's just the truth, I don't want them. Kind of is what it is. It's called life. You know, life is never ideal. It's never ideal. And so these are just some of my thoughts. Um, these are just some of my thoughts. I hope that you've gotten something out of our little conversation today. Um, let me pray for you. Father, I know that there are all kinds of emotions that are swirling 
today relative to some of the things we've talked about. Now, Father, my prayer is that you would take uh, the anointing of your precious Holy Spirit and pour out upon every one of these, your sons and your daughters. Those, dear God, who are struggling with some of these same issues and in this place where they're trying to make decisions about the future of their, their relationships. Maybe they heard some things today, dear God, that are of concern to them. God, let them not move off of my voice, but God, let them hear your voice in their hearts. Give them wisdom. Give them instruction. And now, God, I pray for peace, tranquility, wholeness in their lives. Make them know, dear God, who they are as individuals so that they never again view a relationship as their identity. Make them understand there's a difference between me versus we. The reality of themselves versus the idea of their relationship with others. Give them freedom now, God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Now listen, I've enjoyed this time with you. I want to thank all of you that have sown into uh, Lisa and my life today. We thank God for you. We really do. And uh, don't forget to, those of you that need counseling, need counseling and would prefer to do it online or over the phone, there's a link for BetterHelp Counseling in the description. We have a, a partnership with them and when you use that link, um, they will in turn grant you 10% off of the cost of counseling and simultaneously drop um, a deposit into RSC Blake's Ministries for the referral. So I want you, those of you that may think that's something that you, you, you'll be interested in, just kind of hit the link, follow it, look at it, and you know, make up your mind for yourself. But it is available because I am not a counselor, not a therapist. Uh, don't forget to go by my website, rcblakes.com, check out all of my online programs, and go to Amazon, pick up all of my books. Those of you that have not read any of my books, go to Amazon, search R.C. Blakes Jr., check out my books, and um, support us in that way. Just know that Lisa and I love you with all of our hearts. We really, 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 really do. And we appreciate you for all that you do for us. We really thank God for you. So until next time, I'm R.C. Blakes Jr. Don't forget to like, don't forget to share. Before you leave, make sure you like and share this message with the world. But until next time, I'm R.C. Blakes Jr. saying to you, you're on top and you're going higher. God has more in store for you. So guess what? We will see you at the top. We here at R.C. Blake's Ministries want to thank you for spending this time with us today. Time with us today. R.C. and Lisa are always honored to have you with us. Don't forget to reach out to us by visiting our website at www.rcblakes.com. While you're there, you may join our mailing list and receive a free download of the Laws of Manifesting Your Vision by R.C. Blakes. Also look at all of the online programs by R.C. You may find all books written by R.C. and Lisa. Once again, all of us here at R.C. Blake's Ministries want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And as we always say, see you at the top.